Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Thank you to, for coming to the uh, city's first community workshop on the city council expansion and districting process that we're uh, starting. My name is Brian King, assistant city manager for the city of Irvine. I am uh, the staff lead on this project. Uh, with me is writer Todd Smith with Trapepe Smith. I'm going to turn it over to him in a second. And Dr. Justin Levitt with National Demographic Corporation. Um, they're going to take us through the workshop and here to answer any questions that uh, you may have. And um, this will be the first of a series of workshops. So um, I'll leave it to them to talk more about where you can find out information about those workshops, what they'll entail and the process involved. But uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the team. Thanks, Brian, appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the community at large and for those listening at home for participating in our conversation today. And obviously this will be recorded and available afterwards for you to come back and get additional information and benefit from the conversation we're gonna have. And as Brian noted, this is one of a series of community workshops we're gonna be conducting. So um, it, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities coming up in the future to be able to show up in person, ask questions and really give us some effective feedback, not to mention a whole number of virtual options that we're gonna run through uh, today. So um, if we could cut to our first slide, that would be phenomenal um, and bring that up. So first of all, I also want to just note, as was said, this meeting is being recorded for future purposes. And I say that for anybody in the audience as well. Uh, what that also means is because we are recording the meeting and we want to make sure any questions you have are clearly articulated and heard at home, I'd like to just come to you with the microphone and be able to uh, hand you the microphone and have you speak into it so we can clearly record that. And we'll go to the next slide. So uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, I'm Ryder. This is Dr. Justin uh, Levitt to my left. Uh, and just a little, a little bit, I ha have a firm called Trippepi Smith. We do marketing, communications, public affairs outreach in over 100 cities in California uh, and have had the opportunity to work with national demographics on a number of district formation and redistricting projects throughout the state of California. Uh, and Dr. Justin Levitt is, uh, is one of the premier demographers in the state of California with National Demographics Corporation. Uh, National Demographics is the uh, kind of largest, most uh, uh, dominant, uh, and has done the most district formations and redistricting work as a demographer in the state of California as well. So um, the city of Irvine, uh, I'm a little self-serving in saying this, but I feel like the city of Irvine really tried to pick uh, the most experienced firms out there in this particular sector to ensure that the public here in Irvine has an opportunity to thoroughly participate in this process and get the best outcome for the community here in Irvine. Uh, and then I just want to say on a quick personal note, uh, I bought my first house in Irvine. Um, and then when I got married, I moved into a house about 100 yards away uh, with my wife, also in Irvine. So I uh, am a, a former Irvine resident, uh, lived here for uh, a number of years, and then just hopped over the border uh, to the city of Tustin, where I was about 200 yards away from the Irvine um, uh, city of Irvine uh, proper. Uh, and last but not least, my daughter was also enrolled at Woodbridge High School. Uh, so we had some opportunity to get to know the Woodbridge High School community as well throughout my time. So it's, uh, while I no longer uh, live in the um, Irvine area immediately, uh, I'm not that far away down in South Orange County. I've always appreciated and have a better, a pretty good understanding of, of the area. And so it's really personal for me to be able to come back and participate with the community here in Irvine um, and work through, um, work through this process, this important process. Let's go to the next slide real quick. So uh, today's goals are the following. Number one, we want you to learn from the experts, right? We want you to um, hear from Dr. Levitt and myself, um, mostly Dr. Levitt on the kind of details of the law and the nuances behind that, and, uh, and really benefit from having direct access to the experts. And then, uh, while we might be experts on demography and community outreach, um, you're the experts on the city of, of Irvine. So our job now is to then, as experts, listen to you. You're the experts on Irvine. Uh, we're also going to uh, point out where there's some mapping tools that are available for you to access and um, essentially participate in the mapping process. And I'll just go on a brief little uh, diatribe here to note, like, there are a lot of um, public policy challenges we face in California where we try to address issues affecting our communities. And I will just note that this is one of those few challenges where um, the public actually has an opportunity to directly participate in the process and draw maps to solve the problems. So, um, uh, you know, usually you don't get that kind of opportunity. So, in fact, it's often the case in the preference that ultimately there's a map that is adopted or is almost matches a map that was submitted by a member of the public. That's really um, a, a preference for the outcome of, the, of a grassroots process of uh, 
of the uh, demographic process. And then finally, we hope that once you're done uh, with today, you leave here empowered uh, and in a and I'm kind of prepared to properly participate in this process and um, better inform us about where the communities of interest are and what, uh, what other uh, elements that your expertise has to share um, in Irvine that's gonna help uh, Dr. Levitt here draw maps for the city. Let's go to the next slide. So, and then I'll just, a few points here. Number one, why should you care, right? Why should you spend an hour or so listening to a presentation discussion and then spend some time um, uh, participating in the process of drawing maps, right? I was talking with uh, one member of the community who was expressing that she'd spent eight hours working on a particular map, which is a phenomenal passion for the city. Well, fundamentally, democracy, as we know, works better when the community is engaged, right? So it is our hope that you at home and people in the audience remain engaged in this process and participate because that's just when democracy works better. It's better for our community. It's better for the health of society at large. Number two, you are the experts in this community. You know this community well. You know where those communities of interest are. You know the nuances that um, Dr. Levitt may not have is not being an Irvine resident, and which I may not have, not having lived in the city for uh, several years at this point. Um, and you also not only are experts on Irvine at large, but you know your neighborhood. So when you say, what is my neighborhood, and I do not want my neighborhood carved up, uh, you know what that means to you, and it's important for us to hear as the expert what that means. And finally, I'll just make a point that um, this process is exploring the idea of going to districts and uh, a potential expansion of the city council. Um, as the um, city evaluates that process and explores that future possibility, uh, it will potentially result in a, um, it would eventually result if the city moves forward with it with a charter um, process, a charter vote in March of 2024. And then in all likelihood, whatever that district formation setup is, is going to exist with us in the city uh, up until the 2030, um, census, which will then trigger a redistricting process. So we're looking at about an eight-year timeline uh, for the maps that go into effect, seven or eight years. They'll be in effect until the next redistricting process. So this is going to have a long-term impact on the future of elections in Irvine should, should the process move forward. Next slide. Uh, so today's schedule is we're going to start here at 10 o'clock on the dot. My thanks to uh, Brian for making sure that we were here in a timely fashion, executing with precision as Irvine often does. Uh, starting at 10 a.m., we're going to go to 11.30, uh, up to 1130 if necessary, and then we're going to have to hard stop because we got to pick up this road show and go to another venue today for our second workshop we're doing today. Um, we are uh, going to cover process rules and goals. You're going to get a lot of background information. We're going to show you where to get the mapping tools. And then we're going to have a workshop conversation where we're going to ask the members of the public here to uh, give us any of their ideas around some communities of interest. And so that's when I'm going to have to have the magic microphone come to you. Uh, and then we're going to wrap it up for the day, remind you where you can get more information and move on from there. All right, with that, a uh, bit of housekeeping and information. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Justin Levitt and let him take it away here. So, Dr. Levitt. All right. Thank you, Ryder, for that uh, overview of what we're doing today. Uh, if we could um, go on, okay, we're on the next slide. Up. So, um, basically, my name is Dr. Justin Levitt with National Demographics, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you for joining us both here in person and virtually online. Um, I want to start by kind of explaining what exactly the city is doing as part of this process, or I should say looking at doing. Because as of right now, this, what the, the result of this process will be in your hands. Um, essentially, the city council is looking at putting a measure, a charter amendment, on the March 2024 ballot to coincide with the presidential primary. Uh, that would increase the size of the city council from six or from from five to seven members, um, including an expansion of um, basically um, our system now um, to include uh, the two additional members. Um, and as part of this, six of those seven districts would be, or six of those seven positions would now be elected by district rather than at large. Um, and so, what does that mean? If we go to the next slide. Really, when we talk about election systems, the state allows cities to use three different methods to elect members to the council. Uh, first of all, our at-large system. This is what the city currently uses, and it's traditionally what most cities in California have used. This is where members of the council can live anywhere within the city, and residents from throughout the city vote for all members of the council. Uh, now, what the city is looking at doing is adopting this third system, the spy district system. 
by district systems mean that the city is broken up into several city council districts. Members have to reside and be uh, from in a particular district and only the voters within that area elect that member to the council. Now there is this third system, this from district system. Um, this has traditionally been used by a handful of Orange County cities, Santa Ana, Newport Beach, um, but this is not a particularly um, well used system. And in fact, um, it's, it doesn't actually help a city if, if the city is looking at uh, laws like the California Voting Rights Act. And so the council is looking at this by district system the system is really familiar to us. It's the system we use to elect members to Congress, to the state legislature, to the county board of supervisors, school districts. Um, many other jurisdictions have been moving in this direction over the last few years. And if we go to the next map, we can see that Irvine is actually the largest city, not only in Orange County, but in the state of California itself, that does not currently use by district elections. Um, and in fact, we see that this change has been happening fairly recently. Just 15 years ago, only the city of Seal Beach had district elections within Orange County. Two other cities, Santa Ana and Newport Beach, had this from district system. But today, we've seen that just about every city in Orange County, particularly almost every large city, either has district elections or is studying or looking at the issue. Um, now, I just will mention one more thing, that under this new proposal, the mayor will continue to be elected at large, so everybody will still have a vote on the mayoral position. It's just for the city council members, the remaining six, those would be by district. If we go to the next slide, uh, just to give you an overview of our timeline, we want to make sure to take the time over the course of this year to do this process right. So we're starting now in April with the idea of finishing up in about six months in October to help us get on that, note, on that ballot next March. Uh, right now, we're in this first step of the process where we're starting to go out to the community to talk and ask about communities of interest, to talk and ask about the different factors in neighborhoods, communities that we should could take into consideration as we look at drawing district maps. We're also at this stage inviting you to submit your own community, neighborhood, and district maps. Um, this pro part of this process is community outreach and kind of going to you and the, to different parts of the community over the course of the next month and a half to really hear about the different neighborhoods and communities. So this is our first community workshop. We have five more scheduled, which we'll talk about right here in the next second. After we finish this stage of the process, we come back believe in, uh, let me get the date right, uh, we're going to be releasing those first draft maps on July 4th. Uh, we have to release them at least seven days before the next council meeting where we discuss them. And so in that July council meeting, July 11th, we're going to be looking at our first draft maps here in the city of Irvine. And then what we're going to do is go back out to the community. We're going to take those first round maps that we have and ask people what you think get feedback, get opinions on the different options we saw at that point. There'll be another opportunity for people to draw and submit additional maps so that uh, when we come back a couple months later, we're going to have revised maps, new maps, perhaps modifications, perhaps changes. Sometimes it may even be a combination of two maps. We take the you know north side of one map and the south side of another and see if they can fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And ultimately, what we want to do is to come to the best map that serves the city best going into, um, going into that March 2024 ballot measure. Because whichever map the council picks, well, the council will pick the map, but it's ultimately going to be up to the voters to approve it. That's what that charter amendment is about. Uh, whatever the council picks, you will have the opportunity to have your say on whether that map will be used until 2031 or whether the council goes back to the drawing board. Um, if we go to, and, and if we go to the, and if, if it does, if it does uh, get adopted, we would be using these um, districts as early as the November 2024 election. If we go to the next slide. Uh, for those of you who are interested in where else we're going, uh, this is our first hearing, 10 a.m. on Saturday, April 15th, here in the city council chamber. This afternoon, we're going to be at the Great Park Artist Studios at 2 p.m. 
Uh, next weekend, next Saturday, we will be at the Quail Hill Community Center at 10 a.m. and the Heritage Library Park at 2 p.m. That week, later that week, on Wednesday, we will have at 6 p.m. a virtual forum over Zoom. Um, and then in, in, May, in May, we're going to have two additional community workshops. 3 p.m. on May 13th, we'll be at the South Coast Chinese Cultural Center. And Saturday, May 27th at 2 p.m. at the Lakeview Senior Center. Our hope with this is to give you a variety of locations throughout the city to find whichever is closest to you, easiest for you to attend. Um, and we also have that virtual meeting. And one thing we will have at the virtual meeting is simultaneous interpretation in all the threshold languages um, and any and other languages as well. Um, now, we're happy to provide interpretation services at any of these meetings with 72 hours notice in advance, um, but that one will be recorded on the 26th. The virtual meeting will be recorded in all of the different languages so that we have copies of them on the website for you to watch. So um, please, if this, uh, if this meeting uh, doesn't fully answer all of your questions, we're still in the early days. Please come to our future workshops as well. Um, now, when we draw districts, we have to follow a set of rules. And these rules are laid out for us by the courts, by the state law, by um, decisions made over the years, both at the legislative and judicial levels. And we really divide them into three categories here, because the three kind of areas are sort of a rank order of importance. And we'll talk about that rank ordering a lot when we come to that middle column. But I'm going to start on the left. Federal laws. Federal laws are things that the Supreme Court tells us that we must comply with, and in fact that every jurisdiction that uses districts must comply with. And first and foremost is equal population. Districts have to have more or less the same number of total residents in each, of the, in each district. This is the one person, one vote principle. And for this principle, we're talking about everyone as counted, as by whoever was counted as part of the 2020 census, particularly in, the, in here are California adjusted counts, or as counts toward this equal population requirement. So this includes children, it includes non-citizens, it includes the college students at UCI and other universities. Everyone residing and counted as part of the census counts toward equal population. We take that number, we divide it by six to get our target population. Now, districts don't have to be precisely exactly at that target population. In order to have all of the other criteria met, we can deviate some. We can be a little bit over, we can be a little bit under. And the courts have said there's a maximum of a 10% deviation between the largest and smallest districts. So if a district was at 100 people, we could have up to about 105 people or about as low as 95 people in a single district. And that's really to give us that flexibility to keep communities together, to follow major roads, to accomplish all the other goals we need to accomplish as part of this line drawing process. Secondly, we're talking about the Voting Rights Act. And here we're talking about the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, Section 2 says that protected class communities, which are groups that have historically faced discrimination or barriers to registration and voting, need to be kept together for the purpose of their fair and effective representation. And so we'll be looking at this as we go through the process, because while race and ethnicity can't be used as the only factor or the predominant factor in justifying a district, uh, where we hear that there are communities, where we hear that there are issues that need to be taken into consideration uh, as we look at different areas of the city, different neighborhoods, different communities, we have to take that into account and do our best effort to ensure that their right to vote is represented. Now going into the middle column, the middle column is what we call the Fair Maps Act. This is a 2019 law that the state of California passed that made certain criteria mandatory and in a rank order. So we have to take into account these four considerations in the order listed. First is contiguity. Contiguity is a fancy way of saying that all parts of the district must touch. 
as in there must be one exterior boundary, if possible, to that district. Um, and so what this means is that you can't have a little bit um, of a district here along Jamboree and another little bit of the district at the spectrum with no connection between the two areas. All parts of the district, you have to be able to, as some courts have said, walk or drive from one part of the district and every other part of the district, um, or otherwise be able to have a geographic connection between all the different areas. Below that, we talk about our neighborhoods and communities of interest. The law defines these as areas that need to stay together for the purpose of their effective and fair representation. Now we're going to dive a lot more into what this means in a couple slides, but we want to start thinking about those areas that ought to be kept together, that it wouldn't make sense to break apart into multiple districts. Um, next, we have our following major boundaries. This is really aimed at helping voters to understand which district they live in. Think about the difference between District 1 is north of, you know, let's say, let's just say Jamboree, and District 2 is south of Jamboree, versus District 1, you have to kind of jog one block north of Jamboree here, but it's one block south of Jamboree in a different area. Voters can get easily voters will get easily confused on which district they live in. So to the extent that we can use major roads, canals, parks, canyons, other, maybe even jurisdictional boundaries, like where the school districts overlay um, with, the, with the city to, to, to assign our boundaries, we need to do so. Fourth is compactness. And compactness is the idea that you shouldn't bypass one group of people to get to a more distant group of people. And this is aimed at hooks and fingers, uh, really odd shapes that could only be described as trying to get a particular house or particular property into a district. And now, these are rank ordered. And I point this out with compactness because there are some communities that are less than compact, maybe because of the unique geographies, maybe because of the shape of the city's or city's external boundary. We have to keep those communities together first before we look at compactness. And oftentimes, we're sometimes, you know, I've seen this a lot, people point to something on a map and that, of a city or a state they don't know anything about and say, that doesn't look very compact to me. And then people in that state or that other city will say, well, but it's doing this. This is why we did it this way. Um, and so oftentimes, what we're looking at here is rank ordering these anyway to think about where our community boundaries are first. Now, one more provision in the Fair Maps Act is also very important. This is not about politics. This is not about the uh, political parties or partisanship. We're not allowed to consider partisanship data as part of our process here. Um, and so we're going to be focused on communities, neighborhoods, the geography of the city, and other factors as we look at going through this process. And then finally, in the third column, this third column are other principles that the courts have recognized as being valid to consider. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have to consider federal law first and our state's rank-ordered list of priorities in the Fair Maps Act before we even start to talk about the third column. So something like, and I'm going to use the second one here, future population growth, may be something that we're concerned about. We know that some areas are going to grow faster in the next 10 years or are likely to grow faster in the next 10 years. That can be considered but only after we've balanced the population, only after we've taken compactness, contiguity, all the other principles of the Fair Maps Act into consideration. In fact, we don't even have to take into account at all. If we decide we don't care about future population growth, we just want to use the current numbers, we can do that. And so this third column is really factors we put up here so that if we want to think about them, we can but not necessarily required to do so. So future population growth, as I mentioned earlier, that's the idea that some areas of the city are likely to grow faster in the next decade. And we can kind of take that into consideration as to where we overpopulate or where we underpopulate a district. And the last one is the principle that the voters of the city have elected a council and that it should be up to the voters to decide whether members continue rather than the stroke of a pen on the map. 
Um, this doesn't mean that necessarily that we're going to protect every incumbent or protect every person who wants to run for city council, but it means that that can be factored in um, if and only if we've considered everything else on this list first. And if you don't want to take it into consideration, then we don't have to take it into consideration. That's the beauty of this last column. It's up to you. And then if we go to the next slide, let's, let's dive into a little bit more detail here. Um, and I'm going to make sure I get the number exactly right because we're broadcasting this live on TV. So um, this slide basically is an overview of the census data that we use in redistricting. So most of this is from the census, and the only field of voting and registration data that's not from the census is from the statewide database, the collection of voter registration um, and turnout records that the state keeps. And according to the adjusted population count, the state or the census found 307,958 residents as of April 2020 living in the city of Irvine. When we divide that number by six, we get approximately 51,326 residents per district. So this means approximately, and I'm, and I'm kind of doing an approximate here, we should aim for our districts to be between about 49,000 people and about 53,000 people. That's a very rough estimate, and we could do the math if, you, if anybody would like later, but um, that's an approximation of what the size of the, each of the six council districts would be. Now, total population isn't the whole story. We're going to be looking at this process also at some uh, at part of our race and ethnicity numbers. When we talk about race and ethnicity, we're often going to be looking at citizen voting age population. That's the population over the age of 18 with U.S. citizenship. The courts often like to call this the eligible voter count. And we look at this because, you know, um, we know that a lot of our residents are immigrants or have come over from other countries or maybe are under the age of 18. And so when we look at the Voting Rights Act in particular, our focus is on people eligible to vote, uh, making sure that we don't draw a district by accident that looks like it could potentially elect by total population, by county everyone, that actually isn't an effective district when we look at just eligible voters. Um, and so we also use that registration and turnout data to help us understand where we see those kinds of patterns and trends as well. In the second column, we have some basic demographic information, including age, language spoken at home, um, with some um, employment, education, um, as well as factors like multifamily and single family housing, renter where we find renters, where we find owners. All of this is to help us understand the, you know, the lay of the land, where we see different patterns, where we see different um, you know, trends in different parts of the city. One thing I'll mention is that data is not perfect. As one of our council members mentioned, a lot of this is subject to problems of how do we generalize about a particular neighborhood just from a number on the, you know, just from the number that kind of describes an area as a whole. Um, and what I would ask you to do is kind of take these numbers Maybe, you know, as some information, as something maybe we don't know about the city, maybe, maybe we'll uncover some interesting facts about uh, the city. But these are only a starting point, and nothing is a substitute for your knowledge of the city itself. Um, and so we're, this is why we're coming out here as part of this round. Help us understand what these numbers actually mean to you as residents of the city. And so, for example, we're going to look at some examples here because this is kind of starting to think about communities of interest. Uh, we start with looking at um, our citizen voting age populations, our protected class communities. Um, while we see that there certainly are a lot of, um, there are a lot of different colors on these maps, um, generally the purples represent a lower percentage. So some areas in purple or blue are under 35% of the particular group. The areas that are in red or yellow are over 65% of that particular group. And so while we do see, for example, that there's um, a higher concentration of Asian Americans in the north end of the city, um, part of our question will be coming out to you um, is, 
you know, this is looking at Asian Americans as a whole, the way that the Federal Voting Rights Act has tended to look at the Asian American community. That doesn't tell us anything about the composition of that community or about whether or not it feels like a cohesive community that needs to stay together. And that's where we turn it over to you. Tell us what areas, what, where, where are the subdivisions? Where are the boundaries within that community or within that area? Um, on the other hand, if we don't see a concentration in the colors, you know, an area that's majority African American, for example, it doesn't mean that there aren't communities. And as we come to you and say, I know we don't see this on the map, but this is a historically, you know, African American neighborhood, or this is a historically Latino neighborhood, and this needs to be kept together for the purpose of its fair and effective representation. And that brings us right into defining neighborhoods. Now, the law actually uses two terms. The Fair Maps Act says neighborhoods and communities of interest. And I really love that phrasing because it lets us really dive into a nuance that we often miss in redistricting. I think of neighborhoods as the Lego building blocks of districts, the smallest units that we need to consider when it comes to districting. This might be as small as a single apartment complex or a single street with a shared development history. It might be as large as a planning area or a particular specific plan area, historic district, or other sort of, uh, sort of air neighborhood. But when we think about neighborhoods, we really think about the geography of them. Areas that touch a particular park, border a particular street, that have a common geographic tie in that community. What we want to be able to do with neighborhoods often is say, here is the extent of my neighborhood on the map, where we can draw a clear line. Um, maybe that line comes from a planning department uh, boundary. Maybe that line comes from community residents of that particular neighborhood. Um, maybe it comes from a list of landmarks that need to be included, or intersections that need to be included. But we think about the geography of neighborhoods as having that clearly defined boundary. And that really contrasts with communities of interest. Because unlike neighborhoods, communities of interest are about how we bring neighborhoods together. What neighborhoods need to stay together because they have shared issues, shared concerns, shared problems. And this is where my Lego analogy comes back because we think about each neighborhood as a Lego block, we think about the community of interest as how those Legos fit together to come up with the actual thing you're creating at the end of the day. There may be different ways of combining neighborhoods into communities of interest. I can't count how many times we've worked with a school district in a city that share more or less the same area, and they come up with completely different ideas of what the communities of interest are. Why would that happen? Well, because if we start with the idea of communities of interest being those issues, those concerns, those problems specific to that level of government, that part of government that you're interacting with, school districts are taking different things into consideration than city councils. Attendance areas matter a whole lot for school districts. Where schools are located matters a whole lot for school districts. But school districts aren't taking into account where we're going to see development in the next 10 years in the same way. Or they're not taking into account issues like, um, well, historically there's been an issue with traffic and potholes at this particular intersection, and I think that area needs to be kept together to have one council member dealing with the potholes on this particular street. Um, and so, yes, sometimes, you know, we can say school districts and cities have the same communities in some ways, but you're going to find that it's going to be different, um, just because we're even going to get different people showing up to city council redistricting or districting than show up to school district districting. Um, and so let's take a look, you know, let's think about these issues that bring us together, these issues that need a single representative for their fair and effective representation. And when it comes down to it, that second part that need to be kept together, are there communities, or are there potential communities, I should say, not necessarily defined communities, but potential communities 
that actually might benefit from having two representatives or three representatives for their fair and effective representation. Uh, for example, um, we know this comes up a lot along major roads and major thoroughfares where the traffic or the development issues impact more than just one part of the city. Um, it may make sense to divide, use that road as a dividing line between the two, uh, between two districts, thereby making sure that there are two representatives that have a stake in that particular issue or problem, and that may serve the community better. Um, and so we want us to think about that as we look at trying to understand what our community's needs are, different communities' needs are. Um, again, we have some numbers, and we'll show you here in a second on the website where you can actually take a look in more detail at all of the different demographic information uh, that we have. Um, but we definitely can look at patterns, for example, where do we see more multifamily housing, where do we see more renters, where do we see more children at home, um, which is the percentage of households that have children under the age of 18 living at home. Um, we can, you know, and this, these can tell us some of the story. Uh, you know, for example, not surprisingly, UCI has very few children living at home, uh, while areas kind of in the rest of the city have a much higher percentage. Um, that, only tells us, that only tells us, hey, we've identified a potential community. And then it'll be talking with you on whether or not that's an actual community that needs to be kept together. Um, in addition, some of these we're already starting to look at. Uh, for example, we've had a request in for a map showing the population by the planning areas. Uh, I've been working on that this week, and I think we just got it online. We'll show you it online, uh, where you will be able to show an estimate of the population by planning area. We're also looking at factors like land use and general plan um, zoning, where the school districts, because you know part of Irvine is in the Tustin Unified School District, um, and so where the school district boundaries are, and where those attendance area boundaries are, too. Um, these are all potential communities of interest, and we want you to help us understand which ones are more relevant for our process here. And so in a second, we're going to hop over to the website to show you where you can find all of this information that I'm talking about. And as we do that, I'm just going to say a couple words to start. So if we want to kind of start getting over to the website. Um, we want to hear from you however you want to interact with us. If you want to come to one of these forums and, you know, leave your comments here, or we'll, we'll, we'll have the microphone passed around later if you have something you want to say now, um, or if you want to submit a comment by writing or email. Um, we have blank comment cards today. We have other things you can just um, submit it in writing. Um, if you want to, in, you know, take a look at um, submitting something by email, um, we also have our districting at cityofirvine.org email address that's up and running and ready to go. Uh, we actually have a comment form on our contact page on the website, if we go to the contact page first, uh, where you can uh, submit to us by telephone, by email. Um, or if you want to draw your own maps or draw your community on a map, we have availability, we have, we have tools available to help you with that. Um, and if there's some way that we're not talking about, and I should also mention we have city council meetings where districting will be on the agenda, where you can get up to this podium here and tell the council what your communities of interest in neighborhoods are uh, directly. Uh, what we do, what we do promise, is that anything that we receive through phone, through email, spoken in public, will be taken to the council, and they will see all the feedback that we receive. In addition, any maps that you submit, including most of your community and neighborhood maps, will also be brought to the council, and I'll run demographics on it. I'll, you know, that'll, you know, if it, if it is a legal map submission, if it meets the requirements we talked about it'll be presented to the council as an option for their consideration. Uh, we've actually received three map submissions already. Um, I believe one of them is not quite population balanced, but the other two are. And so all three of them are going to be submitted to the council for their consideration. And in most of these redistricting processes, you know, it's not fully a consultant drawn map just to, you know, that gets adopted. It starts with a public map, a map submitted by a resident. 
Um, and so we really want to emphasize that as you're thinking about it, thinking about whether to submit a map in the first place. And you don't have to submit a map. If you just want to color in your community of interest, if you just want to highlight your neighborhood, if you just want to draw one or two districts that represent the part of the city that you know best, we invite you to do that. Um, one of my favorite things to do as part of a, you know, it's my job, is to look at all the different maps we get in and all the different comments you provide along with your maps and kind of understand where those points of similarity and difference are. Um, a lot of cases, what we see is someone submits a map on this end of the city and somebody else has submitted a map where they're very detailed block by block submission on another part of the city. Well, hey, I mean, they've, they've just kind of drew straight lines in the rest of the city that they didn't know much about, but can we put those two maps together to form a third map that actually represents the needs of both halves of the community or both sides of the community? Um, and so that's part of the process as we go back and forth over the next few months drawing a map. Um, so we kind of, of and so to do this, we've kind of set up this web page, drawirvine.org, as our central hub for all of this information. Um, on this page, you'll find um, our schedule, our, um, let's start with our schedule. We'll, we'll, we'll find our schedule, including all of the recordings, including the recording that we were gonna be making of today's meeting. Um, all the agendas and all of the comments that you receive from the community will be on this page as well, as well as all the times, dates, locations of any hearing or districting related event. I think this page is the one we have to keep the updated the most constantly as we kind of look through and or look, you know, kind of um, kind of add additional meetings and um, to our process. On our on our next tab over, we have um, additional. We we have this is where our draft maps will go once they're published. Um, so right now it's blank because we're still in this first stage of the process but this will be the page we go to with the draft maps when they're ready. Um, and then we have our draw map page where we have our resources that we're going to continue to publish uh, to help you draw your own map. Already we have a couple of different tools available. Our first tool is a paper map. Uh, this is a one page map that divides the city into about 130 areas giving you the total population of each of those areas. Um, now, these are smaller than planning units. These are smaller than villages. Because a lot of times, the villages, you know, uh, as we'll talk about in a second, some of those planning areas or villages are 30,000, 40,000 residents even. And so what we do here is we break it into smaller units anywhere from zero, because there are some areas that are undeveloped, all the way up to about a 1,500 to 2,000 residents, give or take. I think there are a couple that are slightly larger. They tend to be on the edges where that area has to be kept together based on our compactness measures. Um, and so these are smaller than communities. These are smaller than neighborhoods oftentimes. But they give you those population numbers so you can you know, get out your phone on a calculator here, uh, calculator app here, and start drawing your communities of interest or neighborhoods and get an estimate or an idea of what that population would be. Um, this is also people's favorite map to color in with highlighters or markers. Um, if you wanna submit this, actually what a lot of people do these days is take a picture of it with their phone and then send the picture of the map by email to our email address, districting at cityofirvine.org. If that's not the way you want to submit it, if you want to submit it in person, you can do that as well. And we have uh, information about how to do that um, on the website. Um, if we go back to the Draw Map page, we also have our browser-based tool, uh, Dave's Redistricting app. Now, what this tool allows you to do is go block by block, even more detailed than those participation kits. This lets you get into the same block file that we use as professionals to draw your own district, literally going from each city block to the next. Um, now, what I love about this tool is because a lot of people get on there and say, wow, I didn't understand why you always kept this, these, two, these two areas together, 
but now I see that they're in the same census block. Because, you know, one of the things we can't divide census blocks, this shows you where the census blocks are. Now, for Dave's redistricting, um, it, you know, this does require you to create an account and log in. And the instructions for doing that are on the website, and we have a step-by-step -step guide, as well as a video that walks you through the process of signing up for Dave's redistricting. Um, now, we just, uh, just dismiss this. Um, once, you're, once you're logged in, you'll be able to click that link on the website that we just clicked. It'll take you to a map showing you the precincts for the city of Irvine. Um, it's showing you the precincts because basically it wants to start out at a slightly bigger unit than a census block. But once you start drawing, if you switch over from uh, precinct to block, which is just up at the top there, yeah, and then select a particular, any of the um, block, any of the precincts, it'll break it up into those blocks for you. Um, and then using the paintbrush, you'll be able to paint it. Um, we can't do that right here because we're not logged in. Um, but once you log in and create an account, you'll be able to color it in um, and zoom in and see those block, by block details. Um, I think this is one of the you know, most simple way, basically one of the easiest ways to get that level of detail of the city. Um, although you do need a browser, don't try to do this on your phone. You'll, be, you'll find it very difficult to do it on your phone. But on a tablet or laptop or computer, um, you can do this. And if you have questions about this and our videos and our tutorials don't answer them, we're certainly happy to, um, if you reach out through districting at cityofirvine.org, spend some time with you to help you use the tool or figure out how to use the tool. Um, once you're done using the tool, all you need to do is copy the URL and send that to us with your description of the map. And of course, um, if you have any information about you know, why the districts are the way they are, the council would certainly appreciate that as well. Um, finally, on our draw map page, we also have our interactive web viewer. And this is really an important tool because this is where the maps are going to go once they're going to once they're drawn in. Uh, for now, the draw right now we have all the demographic data um, uploaded here, which you can turn on and off using the fields in the uh, on the right. Um, just if you turn on a field, like percent Latino, see that for example, um, you'll see that the Latino detail comes up. So you can turn on and off the different demographic fields that I talked about earlier. You want to see more, you want to see more detail about a particular demographic measure. This is where you can go to do it. This is also where we're going to be continuing to add layers, like the, um, like for example, the um, planning areas are going to be added to this map um, later today. Uh, we're also going to be adding additional layers as needed. Um, and when the maps are ready, when, the, when we start looking at draft maps, this is where they're going to go as well, onto the interactive web viewer. This is a great tool just for looking at maps. You can't draw things here, but you can zoom in and out. You can search for addresses. You can overlay two different maps against each other to see what the differences or similarities are. So this is very much like Google Maps. You can't edit the information, but you can use it to understand and get a better picture of that information. And then as we get requests, we're going to be adding them to this page as well. So for example, we got the request for the planning area map. Um, that map is now available on the draw map tool, our draw map page as well. Uh, it gives you the total population by planning area. Um, if it doesn't look precisely like the actual planning areas, that's because the census blocks don't follow the planning areas exactly. This does the best approximation as we can um, of where those proper planning area lines should be. Um, but it gives you those block populations by those areas. Um, and so with that, I just want to reiterate, and I see we have a hand up in the back, and we're going to come to you in a second. Um, Really, if there's anything we're missing, if there's anything we're not doing with respect to how you would like to 
present or show, share your material, let us know. Um, and again, districting, drawirvine.org, or cityofirvine.org, um, is the best way to reach out to us. We can work with you on getting um, additional data um, if needed, um, or a different presentation if needed. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to our conversation. All right, so now you can understand why Dr. Lovett is a doctor. Um, and we're gonna go into Q&A now, so it's great that we got a hand come up back there. Uh, and I'm gonna come ask some questions, or give you guys a chance to ask some questions. And just remember, we're recording this, so I'm gonna hold on the microphone next to you and hold it next to your mouth while you ask your question, and then we'll have Dr. Lovett answer. And I think for our AV team, uh, we're gonna use this microphone, I suspect, for Dr. Lovett, uh, Dr. Lovett to answer the question. So who had their hand up? In the back. Oh, sorry, I mean, look. First hand up, first mover advantage. So, uh, good, good morning. Uh, my name is Zachary Griggy. I'm a student at UC Irvine. Uh, I also previously served as a redistricting commissioner in Marin County, where I grew up. Uh, and one of the features on our Draw Irvine equivalent website was they provided a kind of recap of all the public comments that had been received each week. Would it be possible to do that for Irvine's districting website as well? Uh, it seems like at the last council meeting it was suggested that the public comments would only become available in the lead up to a city council meeting, but those are, uh, or, or a city council hearing, excuse me, but those are oftentimes several weeks apart, um, and it, I think it would be beneficial to have public comments available on a tighter turnaround time so that we can see those uh, so that Irvine residents that are interested in drawing maps or submitting testimony on their own can kind of see what else is being said. Uh, would it be possible to do that here as well? We can certainly take that back to our team and, and look into it. Um, I, I know the counties were on a much tighter time scale than the city is on, um, but uh, we can definitely take it back to our team and look into that. Okay, there was another question down here. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Susan Sayer. I have a couple of um, concerns or issues that I was thinking about when I was drawing my maps. First of all is the relevance of the 2020 census. Much of Irvine's been built out uh, since that, uh, before that uh, census. But after that census, there's been a lot of increase in the population in the IBC, in North Irvine, and the Great Park um, area. And I'm wondering just how relevant the census population is, number one, to uh, currently, uh, there's also been a lot of construction and residences approved that are be under construction now, which will, in the near future, make the, uh, the, your population data not all that relevant. Um, also, and therefore, the issue is our, how long are our district populations or are uh, um, going to meet your criteria of only being within about 5,000 um, uh, 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 um, residents difference. Mm -hmm. The second issue I have is in the uh, UCI um, IBC area, a lot of students, uh, UCI students reside there, but I'm assuming that many of them may be registered to vote in their, um, where their permanent residence is located, and therefore um, there might be a difference between the number of residents in the district and the number of voters, or greater dis a difference than in other areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Those are so, both excellent questions, yeah, by the way. Thank excellent. you. They come yeah. up. And I will say, the, on the first question on the census, um, I hear your concerns. Um, the law requires us to use the most recent census available. And in fact, California law requires that any data set used must be prisoner adjusted um, according to state laws adopted in the last 10 years. Um, and so we are using the data set that the state requires us to use. Uh, while we recognize that this is a snapshot in time, um, it is considered by the courts and by the state as the best available data at this particular level of geography. 
the, because, you know, even, even the state doesn't release small levels of geography, small units of geography, their estimated populations or actual census counts between the censuses. So we are unfortunately required to use this 2020 census data all the way through 2030. Um, and in fact, there were cities that were literally using 2010 data as they were drawing districts for the 2020 election because we had not gotten the new census results out. And in fast growing cities, this does present a problem. That's why we can take a growth into account to some degree. Um, if we know that there are areas that are likely to grow in the next, between 2020 and 2030, particularly in the next few years, uh, we can underpopulate those areas and overpopulate areas we think are more built out. Um, but it is a known concern that I wish we could do more about. Um, on, on the second question, um, the law requires us to be equal by total population. And this does present problems. Texas actually raised this concern. We have equal populated districts, but we have very serious imbalances when it comes to voting age, citizen voting age, registration, and all that. And what the courts found was that total population was sufficient. Um, and the way that we presented, the way you could think about it is that, um, you know, the problem isn't just college students. In fact, around the country, the problem tends to be areas that have more children, more undocumented immigrants, or more immigrants in general that are not citizens. And the courts have decided that as part of the one person, one vote principle, they have an equal right to representation. And I know college students kind of can get lumped in there because like military, like people in the military, they're often registered in one city and living in another. Um, but the courts have not really made an exception for college students in that way. Uh, and so the UCI provides their estimated students residing on campus numbers, and that's what we use, that's what we have to use. Um, the way that people address this, now there are times where people address this. I remember, um, I believe it was the first time the city of Claremont was going through their districting process and faced with the possibility of having an entire district just on the college campuses, said, well, we need to divide the college campuses because we can't, there aren't enough registered voters just to have one district entirely on the colleges. And so that's something that a lot of cities have looked into. UCSD, for example, in San Diego is divided between two districts for that reason. It was part of the rationale for separating out um, some of the student housing in District 1 and now some of it's in District 6. Um, and so when we look at where we do have to get into divisions of communities, that's one argument. I won't say it's the only option because certainly there are many colleges and universities that are kept together in one district as well. Um, University of Redlands, for example. Um, but it is a challenge, it is a concern. Uh, I'll say another one that's kept together is Chapman. And that was actually a big issue for them to make sure that the entire campus was in one city council district. Um, so um, it's a really important question and we will provide registration and turnout rates in, those, in the districts in all the different maps that we get. So you'll be able to see what those registration and turnout numbers are to be able to compare them across different plans um, and, and make sure we have the best you know, uh, knowledge to make that decision at the end of the day. But really great questions. Thank you, Dr. Levin, for the particularly the helpful examples of the other college campuses that you've worked around or had to address. That was um, super helpful. Are there any other questions? Yep. Yeah. We'll take that to you right now. Yeah, so I, as I said at the council meeting, uh, we as UC Irvine students are very strongly opposed to any of our campus being divided. I think, you know, it's been recognized as a planning area, it was kept together at the county level, the state level. Uh, there's, there's, and there are plenty of registered voters both on campus and nearby areas to make up a district. There is zero reason why we should ever have to divide the UC Irvine campus or the student, uh, 
the heavy student populated areas near campus, namely the UTC area or neighborhood, the Park West apartments and the apartments west of the San Joaquin Marsh. Those areas, even if, when you throw those areas together, uh, there is still additional population to create a district from. You'd also probably include Rancho San Joaquin in there as well, as well as non-student populations nearby, possibly in the business complex. There is zero, zero reason why we should have to divide the student populations in Southwest Irvine. Uh, first of all, thank you for the thank comment. You. Second, that, the, the nature of the comment you just made is also a great segue gold star example of the kind of communities of interest feedback that we're looking for as part of these workshops as well. So it actually affords us a nice transition as we get into that phase of the workshop today. But so thank you for that comment. Um, and um, we'll make a note too with our team. That was one of the first comments about uh, emphasis on not wanting to see the community of interest divided for the um, UCI area. Before we exit Q&A, any other questions? Okay. So this is, uh, I, I saw, by the way, uh, our city clerk also came, came down here to join us up front. Um, did you have a comment? Did you come down to make a comment? You just want to make yourself available to the public. All right. Thank you, city staff, for making yourself available for questions, as always. So our next uh, phase of this conversation is really where we get into your turn, where we have a conversation about communities of interest. And uh, if we, uh, we pop a slide up here that both folks at home can see and our folks in the audience can see, these are the kind of questions we'd like you to think about um, that uh, you should stew on when you try to answer this question. What is a community of interest? Who is part of our community? Uh, what are some of the meaningful places your community recognizes or gathers at? Uh, what are some common connectors uh, or concerns, excuse me, you share with a group? So I won't read through every one of these because you're all um, capable of reading through some of these yourselves. But suffice it to say, these are great questions to think about when you want to identify communities of interest in city of Irvine. Uh, and as Justin noted, these are part of the kind of bigger building blocks, these communities of interest comprised of the little building blocks that are neighborhoods that should go towards building up enough Lego bricks that we have 50 some odd thousand people that comprise uh, a council district, right? And that's obviously contiguous, key point. So, um, so what we'd love to hear from you is when you think about this, like what are those areas that you want to make sure stay together? And we just had a great example um, uh, from a gentleman in the crowd about uh, how um, keeping the UC Irvine area unified. And then importantly, you also added some great context, uh, which we now have on the record too, uh, about other kind of nearby neighborhoods uh, or communities that could be lumped into that to kind of, kind of create a more contiguous environment and where theoretically some of those communities of interest have maybe um, filtered their way into beyond just the immediacy of UC Irvine. Is that a fair description? Okay. Uh, so we'll have you be, since you are such so effective with that feedback, I'm going to come back to you and I'll ask you to express some communities of interest if you'd be okay with that. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we're going to also flip screens to show um, Allie's going to be taking some notes. Uh, so my, my ask for you is that you be patient with her as she tries to type with some haste to keep up with your comments. And but I would also just remind the audience that since this is being recorded, we'll also have the audio tapes to go back to and the video tapes to reference. And um, let me just add, uh, thank you, Ryder, for sure. continuing my Lego analogy. Um, but uh, I uh, want to emphasize that this is a point of conversation, that we don't all have to agree at this stage on where communities of interest are and what factors are part of our thoughts on the questions that we're posing to you about the common concerns, the common issues, the common needs. Uh, we want to make sure that we hear from everyone. Um, and so if you, you know, if you agree, great, tell us that. If you disagree, also tell us that uh, because uh, we want to hear from everyone. Um, so um, not to say that I, I actually really love the detail in the comment we got, and we're going to hear some more detail now. Um, but, um, you know, I just want to make sure to emphasize for those of you who are listening at home that um, this can start a conversation um, as well about where those community lines should be drawn. So with that, thank you. Um, we're going to hear a thank little you, more. Thank you, Dr. Levitt. I appreciate making that clarifying point, too. All right. Let's hear. All right. So, so I guess a, a bit about my role here. I'm the Vice President of Academic Affairs for our student government at UC Irvine. Uh, the testimony that I'm giving is based off of a resolution that I authored that our student government senate unanimously approved uh, to give testimony. 
So the areas that we are hoping to, so a bit about UC Irvine, you know, we're a, we are a university of 36,000 students, 30,000 undergrads, 6,000 graduate students, and uh, university staff and employees that live, on, that live near campus, particularly in the University Hills neighborhood on campus. Uh, we, the university campus itself it consists basically entirely of census tract 626.14, so ideally keeping that all together is, the, is a critical first step. Uh, many students at UC Irvine, you know, we all, in terms of key gathering points, we all gather on campus because we have to attend classes. We usually frequent the University Town Center shopping center, the Campus Plaza shopping center, uh, because those are, uh, the Campus Plaza and University Town Center are the only two grocery stores nearby, uh, at least for most people living on campus. Uh, a number of students who cannot afford to live on campus live across the street in the University Town Center neighborhood. Uh, where housing affordability is, is a, has emerged as a critical issue because Irvine Company changed the guarantor policy. Uh, this, the uh, University Town Center community of interest consists of all of census tracts 62626 and 62627 uh, and would ideally be kept in the same district with UC Irvine. Uh, and so, yes, a lot of students live there. Uh, the guarantor policy is has kind of created a, a significant issue for students there where oftentimes, uh, previously you'd have multiple students, usually with UTC, uh, the rents are, can be anywhere from three to five, five grand per month, and so you'll have a lot of students crowding into apartments. I had a, I, I went to a, a, a gathering at an apartment where they had two students per, like one per bedroom and then a student in the living room for five students for a two bedroom apartment. Uh, so affordability is a key issue there. Uh, we also have uh, students living a bit farther out in the Park West apartments. That consists of block groups one and two uh, east of Harvard Avenue in census tracts 62611. Uh, and those are also controlled by the Irvine Company, but the rents are a lot cheaper. Uh, and so a lot of students live there. And then we also, have a, 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 we also have a lot of students that live west of the San Joaquin Marsh in the uh, Toscana and Villa Siena apartments uh, in, in census block, or block groups two, three, and four of census tracts 626.10. Uh, and those off-campus communities at the Park West and the Villa, uh, the Villa Siena and Toscana apartments all used to be served by the W line, which a, bus ser a paid bus service funded by student fees that helped those students commute to campus. Uh, this er these areas are also within a like two mile zone where UC Irvine does not, kind of makes it harder for students to buy commuter parking permits. Uh, so the availability of public transit there is also critical because students oftentimes have a harder time getting public transit or getting uh, parking passes to, to drive to campus. So they oftentimes have to rely on public transit. Uh, so I hope that kind of, uh, uh, kind of describes some of the student heavy areas. We also are very concerned about uh, potentially getting paired with some neighborhoods to the east, namely the Turtle Rock, Shady Canyon, and Turtle Ridge neighborhoods. Uh, UC Irvine prides itself on being uh, a community that, it, that you know, uplifts uh, or it's a you know, powerful agent of socioeconomic mobility. You know, students, we have a lot of low-income students that come to campus uh, and then get college degrees, a lot of first-generation students. The neighborhoods to the east in Turtle Rock, Turtle Ridge, Shady Canyon are very different. You know, we a lot of our students, the overwhelming majority of our students are renting our housing. Those areas are primarily single-family homes that are hundreds of thousands of dollars in value. Um, I think 82% of, I think the ACS estimates that like 82% of the homes there, housing units are single family homes, uh, if I remember correctly. And 40% of residents in those three neighborhoods made over 200 grand in 2021 according to the ACS. Whereas 40% of students living on campus in, in UTC were below the poverty line. So there's this fundamentally different socioeconomic status on campus and in those neighborhoods. And so we recommend uh, using Culver Drive and Bonita Canyon Drive because it becomes Bonita Canyon south of, I think, Shady Canyon. Um, 
using that as the dividing line so that we don't cross over into those neighborhoods. Um, and so, and pairing UC Irvine with a neighbor, with neighborhoods that have fundamentally different needs. Uh, my, my familiarity with Turtle Rock, Turtle Ridge, Shady Canyon is that they have other issues. They have a lot more open space and a lot more wildfire risk, for example. Uh, and so putting, a, and whereas UC Irvine has a lot more issues with transportation and affordable housing. So putting us in, in separate districts, I think, would also allow those priorities to get more recognition. Anyways, that's all. Oh, thank you for your comments. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, excellent. So I appreciate the, the detail and time and thoughts. So first, foremost, second, I will just say uh, respectfully that I think this is the first time in my time doing hosted meetings where uh, somebody offering some feedback for us actually cited census block numbers as part of the process. So thank you for doing your research on that and offering that level of detail. That was impressive. Okay. Okay, I've been around Irvine since 1969. Can you believe it? So I've watched it really grow up and I've actually lived in Irvine since 1981. When I moved he here, um, everybody that I knew was really close to the idea the identification of the village that they lived in. Every village had its own unique um, characteristics. Um, uh, many of them have a fairly uh, powerful or influential homeowners associations. Um, uh, in Woodbridge, where I lived, you know, over 40 years, I moved there for its characteristics and for the homeowners association. I was a single parent raising kids, and they had a lot of activities for my kids after school. I think it's very important that um, we c try to keep our um, village. Um, um, areas of which is, I know is not necessarily the same as a planning area, but our villages together uh, as a whole and adjoining um, um, villages together. Uh, it's, for those of us who have lived in Irvine a long time, that's what drew us here. So um, I hope you take that into consideration. Thank and you. Is it safe to say, uh, from your perspective and Justin from yours that the, the village areas and planning areas have decent overlap in terms of what those are, I would assume? They're decent, they decently overlap. Um, there are some planning areas that have multiple villages. Mm -hmm. And of course there are some areas where um, actually we're still building village, we're still building out where the village boundary is and where, um, you know, where, where the village boundary um, is slightly smaller than the planning area because it may be the single family homes, whereas the multifamily homes are in the planning area but not the village. Um, and there's a couple of, you know, like every city, some unique uh, oddities in the map too. Yeah. Um, but we'll make sure to get all that information as much as we can online so that we can look at it as part of the process. Okay, excellent. Uh, do you have any thoughts or feedback? Anybody else have any additional uh, communities of interest they want to identify beyond what we've heard today or beyond, uh, uh, in more detail perhaps, beyond the UCI? Yeah. And as a thought about that, um, you know, one of the things that we love is getting partial maps, getting partial submissions where you draw an ideal district in your community, in your neighborhood. Uh, so if you don't feel like you know the rest of the city, don't worry. Just draw your neck of the woods. Um, and that can, you know, especially for communities of interest, that can be way more helpful than just simply drawing lines randomly in part of the city to make the population numbers work in a part that you're less comfortable with. Um, so if you're thinking about some of these questions and you're like, I really know what I would do around UCI, but I really don't know what I would do around Portola Ranch. Okay, let's just draw one or two areas in that area. And then we can kind of take a look at other maps and see what people who come from the Portola community or come from you know, Northwood or come from other neighborhoods um, have drawn in their communities to, to be able to come up with something for the community as a whole. And I'll just note too, like there was in addition to the geography that was cited, just as the example of the UC Irvine feedback, 
one of the elements that I heard in that conversation was access to uh, mass transit or transit options to get to uh, campus because of some shared community interest on those transit issues. Um, identifying those kinds of other kind of policy areas of shared community interest are also um, kind of viable areas or reasons why you would have a defined community of interest, Absolutely. right? So it doesn't just have to be about de demography uh, or, you know, socioeconomic factors. It could also be about shared transit element or some other issue like that. It could be about a major public nuisance and people are unified by a public nuisance. Um, so there could be other factors there that are worth citing as part of the reasoning for the community of interest or the, some of the block areas that you're putting together. Any other uh, communities of interest that folks would like to cite, given the examples that we floated or Justin's comments? Okay, we'll bring that section to a close. So uh, if we could go cut to our next slide and we'll go to our upcoming workshops. And, and remember, for those at home that are watching this later or currently, you can always fire off email addresses, um, emails to us with identifying those communities of interest as well to supplement our efforts. But here are the upcoming workshops that we have planned this time as noted. Um, so uh, we have one this afternoon at two o'clock over at the Great Park. Then we have two on April 22nd. Uh, you'll get to see my bright, shiny face at those again. So if you enjoyed the uh, dog and pony show today, it'll be a redux of that. I think, Justin, you're joining me for that. I will. Oh, Sunny and Cher, unleashed. And then uh, we're going to be uh, on April 26th. Uh, we'll be doing virtual Zoom. So we'll be out there on the intertubes. Uh, and then May 13th, we'll be at South Coast Chinese Cultural Center. And then on the 27th, at Lakeview Senior Center. So. I'm definitely hitting all the patches around Irvine. That was very clear from city direction that they wanted to make sure we, uh, Irvine's a big city, right? There's a lot of geographic footprint. We want to get around town and make sure we touch every corner. Um, next slide is uh, just a reminder about ways to share your thoughts. So lots of modes and options here. First and foremost, the um, drawirvine.org website, super uh, great website to reference. Uh, there is a dedicated phone number we have for the redistricting process, which you can call at 949-724-7575. And then, of course, there's the email address we keep talking about, districting at cityofirvine.org. Uh, there's an autoresponder that will verify for you that you submitted, and then uh, we will try to get back to you in a timely fashion. Uh, and in addition to that, if it's a particularly complex question, we just ask for your patience a little bit while we get through it. And sometimes you may not be asking a question. You just want to offer your community of interest feedback or you want to submit a map or a photo of a map you've drawn, in which case we would, of course, welcome any of that at that email address as well. We're trying to consolidate all that content into one inbox uh, for the city. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to bring it to a close. Um, thank you very much for your participation in this process. We look forward to uh, months of additional feedback, commentary, discussion in the beautiful city of Irvine. Um, I appreciate your time today and the opportunity to get back here to get to work in the town where I bought my first home and uh, built, started to build my family. And uh, Dr. Lovett, thanks for, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank all of you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming out.